Welcome to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. I'm your host, Yang Pratt, and each week we'll explore ways in which the arts can help you raise a smarter kid. I'll be sharing ways the arts can propel your child's learning and interviewing top artists, educators, and entrepreneurs. These guests will share why the arts are so very important to your child, along with actionable ideas you can easily implement into your already busy schedule. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast here on iTunes and share us with a friend. For extra tips on raising smart kids, head on over to artsmartparenting.com and click on the live tab. Welcome to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. I'm your host, Yang Pratt, and I'd like to welcome you to the show today. Our special guest today is Leah Joswiak. For the past 17 years, Leah has been the owner and managing director of the Music and Dance Suite with two locations in Napierville and Plainfield, Illinois. After a successful career as a performer, Leah has devoted her life to spreading the joy of the arts. She is the wife of another musical entrepreneur and the mother of three grown musicians. Leah, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Excellent. All right, let's start at the beginning of your musical life. Uh At at what age were you introduced to music? Well, uh, let's see. I was introduced in the fourth grade. Uh, Like most um, young musicians, they get uh, a chance to try the instruments and see which one they want to pick. And um, I didn't kind of get to pick which one I wanted because my mother already had a clarinet (laughs) and it was, that was what I was going to play. I was going to be a clarinetist. So I spent uh, from fourth grade till about 10th grade playing the clarinet and then um, I was uh, not a very um, uh, good student on the clarinet (laughs) because it wasn't my passion. And uh, so my band director decided that instead of being pretty much the worst clarinetist in the band, that he would switch me to bassoon, which is a very difficult instrument. But since I was the only one, I was the best one. (laughs) So (laughs) so a lot of self-confidence. But uh, in the meantime... I discovered in about sixth grade that uh, voice was going to be my instrument. And so I ended up, um, you know, having a career uh, as a musical theater performer. So I did voice and dance and acting and uh, grew up doing commercials and a lot of, I had a TV show in Atlanta when I was 12 years old, a weekly uh, children's TV show. And I did a lot of educational TV and did musicals, met my husband uh, doing musicals. He used to be a trumpet player for a living, and then we both uh, have transitioned into business. So, uh, you know, my musical career has gone on for a very long time, um, and now I don't do any performing anymore and just sing in the shower. I love that, and that is such a great story, too, and I wanted just to point out a couple things. I want to go back to fourth grade, because I know that around here as well, it's fourth or fifth grade, I think. I think now it's even less. They actually are just given a recorder in the fifth grade, in our schools anyway, but I want to talk about that really big window that happens before fourth grade, and how kids are quite impressionable, and maybe that's a better time for them to start. Let me explain to you about my own children and how I uh, have a completely different attitude about that whole entire experience yes. because I started my daughter on violin when she was two and 11 months. Wow. Okay, so now, uh, yeah. And people say, what? Aren't they just like throwing it around the room? But it was, um, you know, because my husband and I were both musicians, uh, it was obviously easier for us. And we had the confidence to say that, yes, she's ready to do it. Um, At that time, this was back in, um, let's see, she was born in 84. So in 86, right at the beginning of 87, um, I had heard this thing called Suzuki music. Had no idea what it was. At that time, we had the big Yellow Pages book And I looked up Suzuki music and just so happened that there was a foremost expert that had actually studied with Dr. Suzuki in Japan that was very close to my home. 
And so I called him up and said, hey, um, how, how early can you start? And he said, well, I've never started anybody really that early. Usually it's, you know, well into when they're three, possibly four. He said, but you guys are musicians and you know about sort of what's going on. So let's do it and let's uh, make an experiment. So my oldest daughter, who is now 31 uh, and is now a professional violinist, Mm -hmm. um, started when she was two and 11 months and um, it, it was an amazing, amazing experiment. And I totally believe in the Suzuki way of doing music is a mother tongue approach, which means that, you know, when you're, when you're first learning to speak, you learn by listening and you learn, you know, you, you, you tr are sort of trying out sounds as you go along. And that's exactly the same way it is with Suzuki music is that, uh, there's a very large, um, part of the method is listening. So you play CDs of the instrument, you play CDs of, uh, or at that time it was cassette tapes of, <laughs> of instruments. And, um, you know, so we had picked the violin basically because it came in incremental sizes. And so you could start a, a very young child on it. Um, since then, now they have other instruments, cellos that are incrementally sized, um, flutes that have a curved head joint so they can start very early. But the whole thing about immersing them in the music that they will be playing and having them listen to it, and it, it, it just it works so phenomenally well that we ended up putting all three of our children in Suzuki. Uh, they all did Suzuki piano as well as Suzuki violin. And our, my son, actually, he did Suzuki bass. So he's a bassist in New York City. Uh, and then my two girls are both uh, violinists. And my last one is in her last semester of college um, as a violinist. So, so it works. It's interesting to me, I have the same philosophy where I think, you know, as, as soon as they can understand and comprehend what's going on, let's introduce this beautiful art to them so they can experience it as it should be experienced rather than waiting till they're in fourth or fifth grade and just hand it an instrument which they may or may not have a love for. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it was never a thing of us saying you have to play the violin. Um, it was just something to introduce it to. And, uh, my husband and I had no experience with stringed instruments at all. And, uh, you know, but first of all, our teacher was phenomenal. I mean, I have to credit that, but also, um, when you surround your child with other people that are doing something, uh, with a, with excellence around it and parents that are very involved. And that's another thing is with Suzuki music, the parent is involved. I did not learn how to play the violin, but I bet I could teach the violin because I've spent so many <laughs> years of my life in lessons. My girls are 10 years apart. So with the violin, you know, I would go to their lessons every single week. And then the parent is uh, the partner at home. So there are, it, they consider it the Suzuki triangle. So the triangle consists of the parent and then the child and then the teacher. So really when your kid is two and a half years old, obviously you can't send them in a room <laughs> with the teacher and say, Hey, go do your lesson. And when you come home, go in a room by yourself and practice. And I even see that with, with students, you know, that are five and six seven-year-olds, they don't know what to do when you send them in a room to go practice. You know, they play their song as fast as they can possibly play it 10 times and then leave. And that just isn't the way to do it. So, um, you know, having parental involvement in the fact that I would be basically the home teacher. The teacher would teach the child what to do. I would be the observer. I would take the notes and everything. And then I would go back home and replicate every single day what the teacher did in the lesson. And so it was sort of like your kid having a lesson every day, you know, seven days a week. I mean, you know, um, the Suzuki approach says that you only practice on the days that you eat. So, <laughs> and I like to eat. <laughs> My kids like to eat. <laughs> so we, we practiced a lot. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, it's a very, um, it's, it's a great method. I so totally believe in 
starting early. I think it's it's a very important thing. Um, it's it's also not only because of of the learning aspect, but because of the time aspect. When your child is in fifth or sixth grade, they already have a lot of interests, a lot of things that are pulling them away from doing something new. All the things that are familiar are more comfortable. So if they've been playing soccer since they were in kindergarten or t-ball or whatever, that's that's more likely what is going to uh, take up their time. So so when you, in, you know, my kids never knew that other kids didn't play the violin. They thought everybody did that, you know, and, and they thought that when people came home from school, everybody went and practiced. You know, of course, we had to keep the curtains closed so they didn't see them outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, uh, I guess I, uh, you would call me a tiger mother, you know, and, uh, but my kids um, grew to love music. Uh, it was not a thing that we said, you have to do this ever, but they liked it. And we were lucky enough that since we knew about music, it was very easy for us to help them and for us to, um, you know, spread our, our own personal joy to them through, through the arts. And for our listeners who may be scared away by the musical aspect or have never played an instrument, what is some advice you could give to them about starting to play an instrument? Well, I think that, um, you know, listening to your child and having your child experience different instruments, taking them to a young people's concert by the symphony, letting them see and hear instruments, um, playing them different recordings of different, you know, masters playing different kinds of instruments will help a lot because people's ears go in different directions. I mean, my son was, he was definitely, we tried him on violin and it was just not a good personality match for him. He was a mover. He was a, you know, a, he, he, he couldn't sit still. So, um, you know, the bass was a great thing for him because you stand up and, you know, I mean, we're talking about not the electric bass, but the big bass. And, you know, you stand up and you move a lot and um, a lot of your body goes into playing that instrument. So, um, you know, finding something that's your child's personality match, I think, is very important. And listening to them of what sounds good. Some kids, the violin is too strident for. They don't like that. You know, it is right beside your ear. So you are listening to it very carefully. And some kids, maybe a viola sound or a cello sound or a trumpet sound. You know, find out what your child really is gravitating toward. Um, it's It's easier to start stringed instruments when you're younger. Um, because it, the lung capacity that's needed for a wind instrument is really not developed much before, you know, third or fourth grade. Um, I think that the tendency for school systems now to delay um, starting uh, instruments is not an educational um, choice. It is a completely a monetary choice. You know, if they can not have to teach kids for, you know, fourth and fifth grade, well, they're saving that teacher's salary. And, you know, with the arts being cut and everything, there's just my example of it right there is that, you know, they, they really, um, they, in, in our school district now, it's sixth grade, and they are not offering orchestra at all. They're only offering band. So it's, it's really a disservice. Um, you know, we were, we didn't have to worry about, our kids in the public school system um, doing music because our kids at that point, you know, I mean, when your kid starts at two, by the time they're in fourth grade, I mean, my kid had already played what, 10 years or something. So just to have her go to class at the, at the school level um, was not an option because she was too advanced at that point. So we always had to look outside to uh, violin ensembles or um, the Chicago Youth Symphony where uh, all, all my kids were involved with that. There's a lot of wonderful organizations um, that, that you can use that are at your disposal um, besides, you know, doing it through school. So you don't really have to wait until school. A lot of people are, start their kids on piano because they know that piano is good for you. You know, they know there's a lot of research about, you know, the different kind of things that uh, spark in your brain when you do, you know, a, a two-handed um, thing in opposition and it makes the, you know, everything get going in your brain. So um, 
you know, people, I think, understand that more. And so they start their kid on piano. And then when they get to be in whatever grade they start a musical instrument, it's like, oh, then we'll go to another instrument. And uh, piano is a life skill. Um, my kids all played piano until uh, it became evident that doing two instruments at a very high level is difficult. Um, you really needed to choose one at that point. But they all went through piano to get a really good knowledge because once it was determined that, you know, that they've chosen to be musicians. Uh, piano skills are important because of all the music theory and everything that go behind it. And, you know, piano is, is really the uh, basis of, of theory. So to have those keyboard skills makes it all easier for you. You talked briefly about the brain development when they're playing the piano. Here on the podcast, we're all about helping parents raise smarter kids through the arts. So are, what, are, what are the top three, would you say, are the top three skills that help kids succeed in school that they can only learn in the arts? Oh, man. You know, I don't know about only learning the arts because, you know, the, a lot of activities that you do at a high level or you do um, consistently uh, do create some of these skills. But, you know, perseverance, I think, is, is something um, – learning to do um, do something that has tiny incremental successes. So when you practice, um, you know, it's, it's not always, first of all, a, a straight up line. You know, it's just like um, any subject at school. You know, you learn a little bit, you come down a little bit, you learn a little bit more, and you hope that the curve keeps going up. But you have to sort of hit it every day. It's like math. You know, you, you need to practice your skills. And when you, when you learn in, in music about every day, if you get a little tiny bit better, that's all it takes. Cause at the end, you know, it's going to have a large reward. So, um, another thing is, is learning that it's, it's not a race, um, that everyone learns Everyone learns eventually, you know, uh, at Dr. Suzuki has a, a, a quote that says, you're never too old to twinkle and mm -hmm. uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star is the first song that all instruments that do Suzuki learn. And um, he said, you know, you can start at one, you can start at a hundred, but you're never too old. And uh, learning how to do those tiny incremental successes, I think is a really important life skill um because it, it's a hard thing for children to understand that if i do this one thing consistently that it will pay off but when you see you know especially if you if you can video your child and you and it, it's amazing how you don't see it every day it's sort of like them growing you know, when they grow, you don't realize it. And then you walk into a place and somebody hasn't seen them for three months and they go, oh my gosh, you've grown a foot. You know, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. You don't realize, um, you know, how much your kid really is learning every single day. Right. And this goes back to what you're talking about before about the, the Suzuki triangle about needing to have the parent, the child and the teacher to all be part of the process. And if one of those things is missing, then that growth is not going to be what it needs to be. Exactly. And, you know, parenting is hard. It's hard. It takes time. You know, I mean, you didn't have children to not spend time with them, you know, and spending time with a worthwhile activity, um, you know, and, it, and it's a different thing. You know, you have parents that go out on the soccer field and yes, they are passively watching their child. Okay. They're watching their child and cheering them on. Well, when you're doing a music uh, activity and you're sitting there beside your child and you're helping them and you're learning, um, you learn so many parent skills, uh, parenting skills. I mean, amazing to me, there were especially things like nonverbal communication. My, my child, um, on, on the violin. Okay. So you, when you hold the violin, your hand, your wrist needs to be in a certain way, sort of like on piano, your fingers need to be curved. They're not flat. And you can say to your child every day, curve your fingers, curve your fingers. No, but you could also just 
touch the finger very gently as a reminder. And it's sort of the same thing as, you know, you want your kid every day to uh, not slouch when they're mm-hmm. walking, uh, walking around, you know, and it's like, hey, don't slouch. No, go over, touch their shoulder as, the, as you walk by them. And it immediately makes them stand up. So learning those nonverbal communication skills, I think, is, is so important to keep um, peace in the family because <laughs> you're not always yelling. You're not always reminding or you're not always nagging. Um, so things like that, uh, skills that I learned through doing music as a parent were just as important as the skills that my children learned playing the instruments themselves. All right, so we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, There's so many activities, especially as kids get older in school and out of school to choose from. Why is being involved in the arts so important for them? Well, the arts, you know, there's there's lessons that you learn in the arts, like um, learning to question and learning to evaluate, learning to interpret um, practicing self-regulation, uh, practicing a skill of a timeline. You know, if you know you have a concert at a certain date and you have a piece that you need to uh, perfect by that date, how are you going to structure your time so that you can get that accomplished by a certain date? And it's just like, you know, doing a, a, a project at school. You know, you, you obviously can't wait to the last minute. It's sometimes easier to wait to the last minute in school because you can kind of just, you know, pull an all-nighter. Well, you can't do that with a musical instrument because you have to build your muscle memory as well as, you know, your mind with it. Um, you know, there's, there's skills of, like, uh, visualization. You know, visualizing yourself in the concert at the end, playing the piece at the the level that you'd like to play, um, the, the hearing and the thinking and the questioning and explaining, you know, why did you choose that? You know, a great teacher will ask you, you know, why, especially if you're doing something like uh, jazz uh, improv, why did you choose that chord? You know, how did that work in the process? Um, just those kind of, of self-questioning ideas or why did you decide that that needed to um, get louder at that point? You know, there's a lot of in- 